Welcome to Plant Your Seed. I'm your host, Fred Ferris. On each episode, we share stories of how ordinary people have transformed their lives. Each story is compassionate, each story is authentic, and each story is a transformation. Here are the stories of the people who are changing our world by transitioning to a plant-based diet. Today on Plant Your Seed, joining us from London, we have Sean O'Callaghan, also known as Fat Gay Vegan. Sean is a vegan journalist, activist, community organizer, marketer, and travel enthusiast who loves supporting people on their vegan journeys. Welcome, Sean. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here on Plant Your Seed. Let's just jump right in. How and when did you transition to a plant-based diet? Like a lot of people, I imagine, I first went vegetarian many years ago. It was over 20 years ago. And I did that because I wanted to do better. I didn't want to contribute to animal suffering. And because this was pre-internet or uh, pre-common use of the internet, I didn't really understand the implications of the dairy industry or the egg industry. I thought I was the height of compassion just not eating meat. Mm -hmm. But when I was in London living in the late 90s, and my sister had come over from Australia and was staying with me, and like siblings enjoy doing now and again, she used to rip me about the fact that I wasn't vegan because we'd started hearing more about this word mm -hmm. just over 20 years ago, um, in my circle at least. And she wasn't vegetarian or vegan, but she delighted in the, the, the <laughs> fact that she had something to tease me about. And she would say to me, if you care so much about animals, why are you drinking milk and uh, why are you eating eggs? Or why are you um, drinking alcohol that is processed with animal products? Mm -hmm. And so I started having access to AOL dial-up or however I was uh, you know, getting onto the internet back in the olden <laughs> days. And I started to read about you know, the experience of a dairy cow or the experience of battery hens. And it straight away clicked in my mind that this is something that I should also be doing. Mm -hmm. um, I should be living as a vegan. And so I said to my sister, you're right. You know, you're, you're absolutely right. Thank you so much for showing me the error of my ways. She was completely confused by that, of course. She thought <laughs> she didn't know how to take that. But from, you know, there was that one day where she sort of really pushed me to think about it. And the next day I was vegan. And so that's well over 20 years ago. And so the, the seeds of compassion had already been planted for me as a few years living as a vegetarian. But I had my eyes opened by access to information and um, my pestering sister. So it was, uh, for me, it was a way to just, you know, develop and explore and expand my compassion. It felt natural to become a vegan. You've been vegan for over 20 years now. How has veganism mm -hmm. changed? If you had told me 22 or 23 years ago that I would be experiencing things that I experience as a vegan now in 2022, I wouldn't have believed you. Access to food, access to information, the acceptance of veganism, mm -hmm. the celebration of veganism, the fact that I not only go on vegan vacations, but I curate them and run them, it is astounding to me. It is almost like living in the future that I thought would never happen. And I'm thrilled that we're on this path. I think we've got a lot further to go, but it has changed so drastically. Well, I can remember when I was first, uh, when I first went vegan and looking for, uh, I mean, meat replacements were few and far between. Of course, we had um, reliable tofu mm -hmm. uh, or um, dairy alternatives. It was incredibly difficult to buy them, even in a large city like London. And you would often have to go to health food stores that were independently owned. And they often had like one vegan working in them who was, you know, dedicated to ordering in all the latest products. And on delivery day, we used to have to run down there and beat the other vegans in the neighborhood to get the products because once they were gone, that was it for another week. And now I can't walk down the, the street here in London without tripping over a sign advertising like vegan pizza or, you know, the, the latest takeaway shop has got vegan options. It has just completely not only flipped upside down, but uh, we're in some sort of bizarro world. When, when, I, when I visited Brighton the other day, it's a seaside town in the UK, I, I'm, it is not an exaggeration to say every second restaurant was shouting about their vegan options or go, come in and see our vegan specials. It has um, gone from me feeling like the outsider to just feeling um, you know, completely validated in my lifestyle choice. What do you attribute that to? I think mostly 
It's to grassroots organisations and campaigners who have fought so hard to have the right to shop, live, eat, drink, travel, celebrate as vegans. You know, we, we've all worked so hard. And I mean, I'm going back 20 years, but we've got people going back many more decades than that who have asked and have championed for uh, vegan choices to be mm-hmm. given to them. Now, I think it's changed a little bit in the last few years where we are hearing the term plant-based used a lot and the animals aren't being as centered in the argument mm-hmm. about veganism. Um, but I still think that, you know, that's something for old school vegans like me <laughs> to do and to, you know, always carry that flame. I think the thing that really changed and put veganism on the map from the mainstream angle was when big corporations realized they could make money from it. Right. And, you know, we, we saw around five or six years ago here in the UK, I, I was running monthly events for vegans, social events. I was running a hugely successful farmer's market that was 100% vegan, where we would have thousands of people show up on the weekend. But halfway sort of through this vegan explosion of like the grassroots coming up to the mainstream, we got there and we we're like, okay, this is it. We're in this vegan utopia large corporations and large grocery store chains kind of swooped in and said, oh, we're missing a trick here. We should be selling this, these products. Much like, you know, you have, um, I don't know if you have them as much in the US, but in the UK, you have grocery stores on that are miniature versions of big chain grocery stores. So you'll have them on the corner. Instead of having your local corner store run by a family, you now have, like I've been in the US where you have small versions of Target. Mm-hmm or small versions of some of the other grocery stores, and they'll be in little towns and they'll take the place of stores and businesses run by locals. And so the same thing has happened to veganism. It's been commodified and taken away. Like the main money part of it has been taken out of our hands. It's been taken out of the hands of activists, and it has been promoted. So it's good and bad. I mean, we've reached these dizzy heights that we probably couldn't have done without it being commodified to this level. But then it's a bit sad to see independent vegan businesses suffering as a result of that. If we could just go back to your transition to a plant-based diet, Mm -hmm. your sister came over to London and she was razzing you about your diet and how if you really cared about animals, you'd become vegan. How did you feel when she was razzing you about that? At the time, I felt annoyed. But in hindsight, I think I felt defensive because there was so much truth to what she was saying to me. I think that's one great lesson I've learned in life in most situations. If somebody calls you out on something and your first emotion is to be defensive, that's a really great warning sign for you to just stop and take a look at yourself and your actions and to consider why are you feeling defensive. And it Mm -hmm. usually is because there's an element of truth to it. And I think that is a great lesson. Well, it's, it's certainly a great lesson for me, but I think it can be a lesson for all of us in that when we are challenged in life, no matter what it is, whether it's about the way that we shop or the way that we interact with other people or how we vote or um, how we use the car too much, whatever it is, <laughs> if, we, if we feel defensive about that, there's probably an underlying truth to what is being presented to us and it's worth exploring. And that certainly was what happened um, between my sister and myself was that she presented the harsh facts to me in the form of loving the sibling rivalry. Mm -hmm. And it struck such a chord in me that I recognized that as something that needed to be explored uh, internally. Now, at the time, you probably thought you were living your values, correct? That's right. I thought I was the height of compassion. I thought I was, you know, the, the friendliest person to animals on the planet. Now, how did it feel when she challenged your values and you realized that she was correct? When it clicked in my brain that I needed to make a change because I understood where she was coming from and that there was truth to it, it felt exciting all of a sudden. So, of course, I went through that the feeling of uh, being challenged and defensive like we discussed, but Mm -hmm. then I moved through to that that acceptance turned into excitement because I realized that I could expand my compassion and that I could find other ways to improve outcomes for animals or at least not contribute to animal suffering. 
And that was exciting for me. And then it was also exciting because it opened up a whole new world of possibilities. I started planning vacations around vegan eating or places, cities that I'd heard were vegan friendly. And so to me, it, it didn't restrict my life. It, it turned my life into almost like it turned a page and there was a new chapter there. Mm-hmm. And I had, and I was in, you know, instead of following the path that had been laid out by me, by society, like, um, you know, eat meat, eat dairy, animals are ours to use, wear and eat. And uh, as we see fit, suddenly there was this new future in front of me that I was in charge of writing. And that felt exciting. It felt like it gave me, uh, it gave me some autonomy back and sort of self-determination about how I was here on this planet. Now, 20 years ago, it was a whole different scene as far as what was available to people to eat. There was tofu, as you had mentioned, but did you struggle with anything going from being vegetarian to being vegan? Yeah, I I did struggle with the accessibility of always having something to eat, but I didn't struggle with cravings. So I did struggle with sometimes I would go half a day or a day without having anything to eat if I was traveling because I couldn't find anything. Mm-hmm. If I was in an airport or if I was at a gas station on the motorway or, you know, I, so I didn't always have the snacks that I would have now or the food or the sandwiches or the, the burgers that I would have now to get me through those difficult times. But I didn't struggle from an emotional point of view or I didn't waver because I mean, this is something that I tell a lot of people when they say, well, how can I stay vegan? How can I, how do I know when it's the right thing for me? And the right thing for me was knowing there was a connection between my heart and my brain. So what I wanted my mark to be in this world and what I wanted my impact to be, matching up with the knowledge that I had gained, with all the information that had been shared with me, it, it matched. And so then it was a no brainer. It was like, Oh, I don't need to think about this anymore. I don't need to struggle about this anymore. This is my truth. And this is how I live now. And I'm just a find a way around it. And that's how I approached life from that day on. And, uh, you know, it's not easy uh, at first. Well, it wasn't then. I think it's a lot easier now, yeah. but over 20 years ago, it was difficult. And I can remember I had the privilege of being able to travel um, back then, and I traveled to the US and California and Nevada, and I can remember printing out pages of MapQuest uh, documents <laughs> because we had those <laughs> smartphones and marking where I'd heard a rumor that there was a vegan restaurant, and we would drive <laughs> up and down these streets with all these taped together MapQuest pages to try and find, and then you would see the magic V word on a building or like on Sunset Boulevard, and you'd screech into the parking lot, and you know, like. That was how we even traveled. We didn't have, you don't jump on the happy, you didn't jump on the happy cow app Mm. 25 years ago or 24 years ago. You had to find things by accident often. And it was very, very, um, it was very grassroots orientated. Like I'd I'd even go to vegan potlucks that I'd heard about or I read about in health food stores when I traveled. So if I'm, I can remember going in, um, in LA once to a health food store and seeing a little notice board that said there's a vegan potluck, please bring a dish to the park. And I, without knowing anyone with no internet access, so I just showed up and, and joined 40 other people to have a nice picnic. And, and I think there was a lot more uh, reliance on grassroots and community back then when I went vegan than there is now. You don't need so much to rely on your neighbors to access veganism like we did back in the day. Now, when you changed from vegetarian to vegan, did you have any issues with friends? Did friends look at you differently? No, I think that people, the the only issue that people had with me was that they didn't understand what it meant. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a matter of explaining to them, oh, this is what I want to do. And my partner at the time also um, became a vegan and adopted a vegan lifestyle at the same time as I did. So we were in it together. And people didn't understand what it meant. And some people didn't understand. Well, actually, a lot of people didn't understand the motivation for it. And so a lot of that are being asked questions all the time. Like, why are you eating that? Or what do you eat? Or how do you get your protein? Or It wasn't, I didn't see it as people attacking my veganism. I saw it as people genuinely confused by the, the concept. 
And so I was always happy and I still am always happy to talk about it. And of course there were people who would make bacon jokes or cheese jokes or, I I mean, I've heard every joke. I'm sure we all have a Mm. million times. And just like with anything in my life, if something felt it was coming from a place of ill will and not genuine concern or uh, camaraderie, I mean, those people were not in my life anymore. (laughs) And that's not a, a dramatic you know, militant vegan speaking, that's just me who doesn't want to be hassled in life about anything. Like if if somebody wants to, you know, rib me about something constantly, I don't think they're my friend. And so, you know, my friends were supportive as much as they could be and as much as their understanding allowed them to be. And, you know, my friends who I had well, before I was vegan are still my friends. And some of them are vegan and some of them are not vegan. And they're still my friend because we have an emotional connection and a loving connection that uh, transcends each of us as individuals. And so, you know, my place in the world doesn't, you know, my understanding that I live as a vegan doesn't stop me from loving those people. People know your work and your blog under the name Fat Gay Vegan for over 10 years. Yes. How did you get started? Um, as a fat gay vegan, or <laughs> <laughs> you know, I um, back in, way back in the day, I used to write. I've always loved writing since I was a, a child, and I used to write a blog on MySpace. Mm. And um, if, you know, people want to cast their minds back to to that time in history. But I enjoyed the process of sharing my thoughts and my experiences, and uh, just by default, a lot of vegan eating and travel. And when MySpace stopped being a thing, I really felt adrift. I, I didn't know where I could share my thoughts. And I especially wanted to share the the vegan experiences I was having because I built up with friends and some strangers a kind of relationship where people enjoyed reading what I had to say about my vegan adventures. And so I decided to start a new blog. And at the time, blogs were still a thing that uh, didn't seem very old-fashioned. You know, now they seem a little bit dated. But 12 years ago, it was kind of like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I'll I'll do a blog. And I wanted a catchy name because at the time, everyone had blogs that were called like, you know, Vegan Running Mom or, you know, there were usually three word titles that depicted exactly who the person was. Mm -hmm. was, And so one day I was joking with a friend and I said, well, if I'm going to name my blog in that style, the three things about me that are the most obvious are fat, I'm gay, and I'm vegan. <laughs> and it was so funny. We doubled over laughing <laughs> at the concept. And I just said, I'm going to call it that. And I had a few people say to me, look, you shouldn't do that. Some people won't see the irreverence, or some people won't see that uh, the self-deprecation, and some people might think you're making fun of that. And I was like, well, it's, it's you know, they're the things I'm calling myself. And weirdly, there are things that have been used in my life to hurt me as well. And so for me, it was a way to reclaim the power of those words Mm. and turn it into something positive. And because I've dedicated the last 12 years of my life to um, celebrating people within their veganism and their choice to live a vegan lifestyle, those words have turned into a positive affirmation. I mean, when people come up to me on my events, and say, hi, Fat Gay Vegan, thanks for everything you do for the community, and thanks for running this event. It's so wonderful to hear those words said in a positive way. That's great. One thing I love about you is that you're very open and honest with your affiliations with companies like Temple of Satan, a highly rated London restaurant. Has that ever caused you any difficulties? No. Because uh, I do sometimes have people, like anybody who's in the public eye, and especially on social media, will have accusations level against them all the time, saying, were you paid to do this? Or mm-hmm. um, did they give this to you for free? Or, you know, I'm completely open about that. I, I, if 99% of what I write about is unpaid, and so it won't say sponsored, or it won't say hashtag advert, or it won't have any of those disclaimers because most of what I do is for free because I believe in supporting independent vegan business. And that's why I do what I do. But when I write or an article or if I post a photo that has been sponsored, I'm very clear. And I'll say in no uncertain terms that this is a sponsored post. I, I don't think it's caused any problems. I think 
you know, the following that I've got has grown very organically over the years. And I do believe there's a level of trust between myself and the audience that follows my accounts that they believe what I say. I don't think that there is um, much, you know, or if any mistrust around those issues. So it hasn't caused a problem. I mean, it has caused a problem when uh, a restaurant has asked me to come in and review their food and I said I can't because I'm too busy. Sometimes, and this is only probably I can count it on one hand, um, they think that I'm fishing for money or <laughs> mm. payment. But I'm like, I'm actually just too busy. I can't come <laughs> in. I'm sorry. If I, if I could come in, I would come in. My, my rule at the moment is I genuinely don't charge independent, vegan-owned businesses for coverage. And I'm happy for people to send me content. I don't have to visit them. I don't have to take any products. If they want to send me a product, that's fine. But I sometimes even turn that down. I'm not, I'm not into people spending money for me to talk about them. But when it takes up more of my time, so the, um, the involvement that I have with Temple of Satan is uh, a little bit more engaged from my end. Mm -hmm. Where I'm currently working with another independent vegan business in London called Essential Vegan, and um, and then obviously uh, I've got an event coming up, my London Vegan Social, which I run next month, is being sponsored by a vegan meat company called Squeaky Bean. So those things, those people are paying me to do something. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say they're great if they weren't, or I, I, you know, I'm very clear and on the level about everything. Uh, and if anyone wants to ask me any questions, just slide into my DMs and I'll tell them. <laughs> <laughs> you are a critic of all things vegan, from restaurants and products to services and experiences. Have you ever tried cell-based meat, and what are your feelings about it? This is a tricky one, isn't it? Mm. I, I always, Whenever I hear someone ask this question, I'm almost... I'm so nervous for them because it's such a, <laughs> a minefield. Of it's a slippery slope. That, yeah, you know, the reactions you can get from people. Mm. I have never tried anything like that. I'm not against, like, I wouldn't judge anyone for doing it. And, mm. I, like, my veganism isn't based from a judgment point of view anyway. Uh, it might surprise a lot of people to know that my current husband is not vegan. And so I don't live from a, a judgment-placed point of view in the world, I do what I think that I can do to contribute uh, the most good and contribute the, the least amount of harm to the world But as an individual. Now, of course, if anyone wants to go vegan and wants some tips or support, I'm there for them 100%. But then when it comes to the cell, you know, cell-grown meat alternatives, um, I don't think, personally, if I had the opportunity, I would eat it. If... At any point in the production chain, a real animal had been used or utilized because my understanding of veganism, my personal approach to veganism is to eradicate the use of animals as much as possible. And I don't need to eat that meat to survive. Like I don't need to eat that meat. Like I might take a medication that somewhere along the supply chain has been tested I'm an animal that is completely out of my control and I need that medication to survive. Right. It's different to me going to Burger King and buying a cell uh, grown burger just because I fancy having a burger. If I want a burger and I want to have that experience of eating a steak or a burger, I can replicate that without any animals being involved in any stage of the production of that. Now I have heard, I don't know, maybe you could clarify this for me, Fred, but I've heard that there are scientists now who are replicating not not using a cell, but replicating the DNA of meat and dairy and even honey. So they're creating the same product without ever using any, um, even a minute part of an animal to do that. Now that to me is interesting. I still, it still has kind of an icky factor because of being a vegan of over twenty years. I have been socialized into having a slight form of repulsion for um you know certain types of products right but to me that's more palatable than um something that has actually been grown from the cell of a living animal what is the connection between compassion for the welfare of animals and compassion for the respect and well-being of humans i mean there are so many people who've had so many wonderful 
things to say about that and much more eloquently than I could ever say. And so I can only really speak for myself, but if people want to uh, go and find more words of wisdom that are much more uh, powerful and profound, maybe uh, look up someone like Angela Davis and find much more profound words. But for me, I'm on the planet to not hurt anybody. And so for me, it's a social justice issue. So if I can buy something that lessens harm or the way I shop can lessen the harm of people, um, animals or the planet, that's the only choice I really have. Like I don't think that um, for me, compassion should be limited. I think mm-hmm. compassion is limitless and that if we can apply standards of care and compassion towards animals, we should be doing it for humans as well. And to me, it almost has a symbiotic relationship in my mind and my heart that you know, what I do, like I challenge myself on um, the, the racism that I grew up with and that I sometimes exhibit still um, through being socialized or the uh, indifferent attitudes that I can still sometimes find myself having to non-human animals, even though I try my best not to. You know, to me, it's, it all works as one. Like if I can take one step forward to humans and I can, I can drag my, <laughs> my, um, I don't know if it's my intellect. I, I, I get a bit confused about what part of me is powering this. Is it my, uh, is it my heart? Is it my brain or is it both? But when I move forward for animals, I move forward for people and I move forward for the environment and it all goes hand in hand together. It, it doesn't have to be separated and you don't have to fight injustices separately. We can fight all injustices at the same time. And it works better that way. You're more powerful, you're more convincing, you, you're you more effective. If you are, you know, asking people to eat vegan or showing them why it's a great way to do it, but you're also making sure you're doing your local parties in a restaurant that pays people living wage or fair wages, you're showing people that compassion for animals and humans doesn't have to be separated. When you look at social justice, it's all about equality, right? To be socially just, every individual must be treated equitably and fairly by society. Is veganism a social justice issue? I think it is. I think, uh, I think there is a big difference between equality and equity. And I think that we are still in a stage of human development where there's a lot of equitable work that needs to be done. It's not about just dragging people up to the same level or giving them the same rights as other humans have. It's about redressing historical and current uh, discrimination and oppression that has you know, made it uh, impossible or difficult for people to thrive. So I think the same for the way we treat animals we we don't want to treat animals, or I don't think we want to treat animals the same as humans. I don't think it's an equality issue. I think it's an equity issue. Animals need to be treated with dignity that relates to them and to their sovereignty and their independence and their determination to, to live as healthy, happy beings. And, uh, you know, the most obvious way to not do that is to, you know, or to the most obvious way to head towards that direction is to not farm them on an industrial scale. And you know that's obviously where veganism comes in. So to me, it is a social justice issue. Um, also, that mass production of animals for food affects humans as well, um, slaughterhouse workers or displacement of communities because of farming, a lack of water, lack of um, mm-hmm. resources that are uh, steered into the animal agriculture. And so it is tied up inextricably with uh, social justice issues. What is one thing that's really exciting you right now in your life and your career? For me, it's exciting that I run events. Um, You know, I run a monthly event here in London called London Vegan Social, where 100 people come every month and we we party and karaoke and drink in a pub and there's a vegan kitchen. I'm excited that I have... um, this uh, desert adventure that I'm running in May, you know, where people can travel with me uh, on a bus and we stay in a hotel, we eat vegan food, we go and see the Grand Canyon. I'm excited by those 
physical manifestations of what I do. But I'm really excited that people are still excited to explore their compassion and to do it in a social setting. That is really exciting to me because when I went vegan, I didn't have a lot of people to reach out to and to celebrate my veganism with. I often had to do it alone and I had to have these feelings of achievement or um, happiness about what I was doing alone or with my partner at the time. Mm -hmm. And so now when I can stand in a room with a hundred people and we're eating vegan food, drinking vegan drinks and people are doing karaoke and people are enjoying each other's compassion and, or I can go on a, a, an adventure where I take a tour group around Utah and um, the desert and we eat vegan lunch in, uh, in the desert or we sit around a, a campfire at night and we roast vegan marshmallows. That feeling of uh, that collective compassion is really exciting to me. So whether it is a vacation I've curated or a holiday or I just even go into a shop and I reach for the same vegan product as somebody else at the same time, Hmm. That that collective compassion is so exciting to me, and it is one of the most satisfying things in my life. Now, can you share with us a little more about the Desert Vegan Adventure, the tour of the U.S. National Parks? That's right. I mean, there's a lot of information at veganculinarycruises.com. Now, that might sound a bit weird that it's a cruise website when we're running a land tour, but because of coronavirus and the pandemic, uh, most cruises on the planet are on hold or at least extremely restricted. And so the idea was for us to celebrate getting back into travel. We wanted to do it in a way that, um, you know, our friends would feel more comfortable. And so we decided on a place that is actually one of my favorite places on the planet. And it's the desert um, outside of, uh, well, around Utah and around that bottom left corner of Utah. And, we're going to be based in St. George in a hotel Mm -hmm. and we will be taking day trips every day to explore national parks of the region, including the Grand Canyon, Snow Canyon, Zion. And my favorite part of the trip that I got to put together is the upcoming day trip to best friends, animal sanctuary, which is, if people don't know, is a extremely famous no kill animal sanctuary in Utah. Um, in the desert, absolutely stunning scenery. And I've never been there. I've been reading about it for 20 years. Mm. And uh, this is a big thrill for me. It's kind of like one of the pinnacles of my life, actually. Definitely my professional and personal life is to get to go to this sanctuary, meet the people who do the hard work and um, find out what they do and hopefully see some happy animals as well. Now, is there still space available? Yeah. So the idea of the trip is there is no bottom limit and no top limit of how many people can come. Well, actually, the top limit would be the number of rooms in the hotel. But um, Mm -hmm. the idea is that it's an immersive uh, vegan adventure. It's kind of like a, I don't know, like a, you know, when you go on a getaway where everything's included, Mm -hmm. like an all-inclusive vacation, but it's vegan. So we bring vegan chefs along to the hotel so all of the meals are included. The hotel's included. We have vegan toiletries um, in, in the hotel room. Um, we have myself on every trip talking about uh, vegan aspects of what we're doing. We visit vegan businesses. We'll visit the, the vegan-run animal sanctuary. And um, so the, the space is there. At the moment, we have just one bus um, on the trip. But if for some reason your listeners want to um, book in large numbers, we can always expand that. But at the moment, it's going to be um, pretty much a bus load um, going around together and enjoying beautiful scenery, beautiful food, and each other's compassion. Now, I read that you're involved with a water charity. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, I spent some time in Mexico. My husband is Mexican, and so my time in Mexico City... Um, I spent a lot of time there actually getting involved with uh, promoting local businesses, vegan businesses, but also um, my attention was grabbed by a charity that does great work in bringing clean water infrastructure to those most at need in Mexico City. The charity is called Isla Urbana, so that's I-S-L-A, new word, U-R-B-A-N-A, 
And what they do is they build ward catchment systems for buildings. And they use local people, they use the local workforce to train them to build it, and they train them to upkeep it. And so houses that have no access to clean water or um, very um, erratic access to water brought in by trucks, uh, which can be every couple of weeks, the idea is to give them um, autonomy over their water supply, the usage, and the catchment of it. And the charity raises money. All of the money goes into the training programs and the equipment um, to build these water catchment systems. Now, the water catchment systems are put onto private homes in Mexico City, and they're also put onto schools and local council buildings to make sure that people who are most at risk have access to water. And private companies can also pay for Isla Urbana to come in and build the systems on to their buildings, and then that money is obviously folded back into the charity as well. It's a really fascinating charity, and it's something that we don't think about in big cities often is access to clean water. But Mexico City is one of the biggest cities on the planet, and a lot, a huge proportion of their population lives without access to clean, dependable water. I just love what you're doing. Now, how does it feel to live your values like that? I mean, you're living compassion. You're, you're living empathy. You're living kindness. <laughs> Thanks. The first thing I'd say is that I can always do better. And I think that's how I live. I, I don't think that, you know, back when I was, you know, 23 or 24 years ago when I was younger and I was a vegetarian and I thought, oh, well, that's all I need to do. Now I know that I'll never stop learning. And mm -hmm. so instead of thinking I knew everything and I was the pinnacle of compassion, I now always look for ways to improve uh, my impact on the world. So I'm vegan, but do I always buy fair trade? Or, um, you know, this uh, charity that I'm helping um, is there something else I could do? Is there another charity that I could also help? Is the, you know, the way that I access my energy, am I doing it in the kindest way to the planet? Should I switch energy providers for gas and electricity to make sure that um, the, the funds that I'm paying aren't being used uh, to damage the environment? How about my banking? Like, could I find a, an ethical bank that doesn't fold my money back into, like, arms? manufacturing. There's always something we can do. Now, I know that sounds daunting, and it can sound daunting to a lot of people, but to me, it's actually encouraging. Mm -hmm. I find myself encouraged by the idea that there's always something I can do, that there's always something I can learn. And so it goes back to when uh, we were talking earlier, where when somebody says something to me about, hey, you're not doing this, but you believe in this, instead of being defensive, I now take that that slight little feeling of annoyance or defense, and I turn it into an opportunity to learn. Mm. And that's how I keep going. And that's, you know, that to me is exciting. That to me is the thrilling part. Not that I think I'm a great person or everyone should look up to me or I'm doing things the best way. You can always do better. As a boy in Australia, did you ever think you'd end up where you are now? No. When, when I was in Australia, uh, I, I don't know uh, if you if you know of this, but I have a book that I published mm -hmm. a few years ago, and it really was a, a blueprint for compassionate living about how I care about people and the planet and animals. And it was kind of like a, my approach to life, but it was sort of scattered through with personal stories and memories from when I was a child. And I had a an idea that when I was young, I wanted to get out of Australia and I wanted to travel and that I could only be happy if I was somewhere else. And I can remember sitting on a cliff top, a beautiful clear blue day and the sun beating down on me in Queensland in Australia. And I can remember thinking there was a plane in the sky and I thought, if I could just be on that aeroplane going somewhere, I don't know where, I didn't know anything about the world, I would be happy and that there would be opportunity for me. And it's taken me a long time, many decades, to realize that no matter where I go, all I've really got is myself and my beliefs. So you can't run away from that. And that, that's what you have to make peace with if you want any level of happiness. And 
So I think back often to myself as that young child sitting on the cliff, and I think I wish I could go back and tell little me <laughs> that mm. the journey is you. You know, you're the journey. You're not going to go anywhere that's going to make you happy because everywhere you go, there's somewhere else that's going to look more attractive or there's going to be somewhere else that takes you further away from your problems. And so that addressing your own happiness and addressing your own place on the planet and making sure you do what you think is the right thing is what's important and will bring you happiness. And, you know, growing up in Australia where I, I grew up in a state where it was illegal to be gay until 1990. So mm. my early teenage years was living in that environment or animal, the use of animals was everywhere. And it, you know, so I grew up in what I found to be quite a hostile environment for myself, for animals, for um, people who weren't white. Like, I, I mean, uh, Australia, most people know, is quite a racist place as well. Mm. And, you know, so it was quite a hostile environment. And so those the journeys that I needed to go on in the world, I'm happy that I've done them all. But, you know, really the, the, the real work is inside me. And that's where I, you know, I'm happy to be most days now, no matter where I am on the planet, Mexico City, London, Brisbane, Utah, St. George. Mm. It's... Um, you know, I if I'm not okay with who I am and my contributions to the planet, I'll never be okay. And so that's where the real journey happens is on the inside. Now, besides your book, Fat Gay Vegan, Eat, Drink, and Live Like You Give a Shit, what other books or cookbooks have you gifted most to someone transitioning to a plant-based diet? I don't know if I have gifted many, but my favorite cookbook that I've ever gifted to someone. And the, the best reaction I got from it was Vegan Cupcakes Take Over the World <laughs> by uh, Issa Chandra Moskowitz and Terry Hope Romero. And now I bought that many, many, many years ago. And I was at the launch party of that book in New York City. And I had both of the cookbook authors, um, Issa and Terry, sign that to my sister and um, to my sister, Michelle. And I gave it to her, and, and she still got it and cherishes it. Now, she's not vegan, but she'll often um, go to that for cake recipes. And it was just a very exciting thing for me because it was close to when I became a vegan. It was a few years into my veganism. Mm -hmm. And to meet vegan celebrities like them who were kind of, to me, were the most famous vegans on the planet at the time. Mm -hmm. They were known. They were known by vegans as uh, you know. They had uh, like online blogs, and they had a cable TV show in New York about cooking. To me, that was so exciting, and I always remember the thrill of holding that vegan cookbook in my hand and having them personalize the message to my sister back in Australia. It felt like a really exciting place to be, especially as veganism was starting to really explode from a bizarre cult sort of underground thing into being more well known and accepted. Yeah, I love that vegan cookbook. And then, of course, you know, Issa and, Issa and Terry have both gone on to do countless books and amazing, amazing work around promoting vegan food. And uh, Issa's restaurants in um, New York and Omaha are absolutely uh, overrun with rave reviews. So, you know, these people are, you know, the pioneers and the true superstars of the, the vegan scene for me. Now, finally, can you give me one word to describe how you felt before you became vegan and one word to describe how you feel now that you are vegan? Before I was vegan, I was searching. And since I was uh, vegan, I'm searching. <laughs> I know that's <laughs> not. It doesn't kind of, I just feel like I was on a path and now I'm on a path. And I think I'm on the right path now. So I know that's not one word, but searching kind of fits both. No, it's perfect. I love it. It's such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. What's the best way for people to follow you on Instagram, the web, Patreon, and social media in general? Oh, the best way is to go to Instagram, and it's just Fat Gay Vegan. And it's Fat Gay Vegan on all platforms including Patreon, if anyone wanted to support me in my mission to support independent vegan business and improve outcomes for animals, you can make a monthly pledge at patreon.com slash fatgayvegan. And my blog now in its 12th year, I think, is fatgayvegan.com. And, of course, 
um, follow along with veganculinarycruises.com and hopefully I'll see some of you on the trip to Utah and, and to the national parks and if not, on a vegan cruise in the near future. All right, Sean. Thank you so much for being on Plant Your Seed. Thanks, Fred. I've loved the time with you. Hope you are inspired by this story. And remember, it's never too late to plant your seed. Links to everything we talked about on the podcast can be found on Instagram at plant.yourseed in the show notes tab in the bio. If you enjoyed the show, remember to leave us a review. And until next time, thank you for listening.